You're welcome to our third nutrition video. In this video, we'll talk about dentition, we'll talk about enzymes, we'll talk about digestion in man as well as in other organisms. Now, dentition refers to the number of the different types of teeth that are found in the mouth of an organism as well as how these teeth are arranged. Typically, teeth are found um, in different animals. Plants, of course, do not have teeth. And these animals are mainly vertebrates. However, among the invertebrates, it's also possible to find teeth, like uh, mollusks, that is um, the snails, the slugs, and several others, are known to have teeth in a part of their bodies called the radula. However, amongst the vertebrates, Teeth are very commonly present, except for the birds that do not have teeth. Now for the fish and the reptiles, they continuously replace their teeth. That is, many of them lose their teeth over time and continue to replace them throughout life. In the case of humans, we lose our teeth and replace them just once during our lifetime. It means therefore that at birth, we are born with, um, okay, we come without teeth. After some time, we develop the first set of teeth, about 20 of them, and we shed them over time, only for them to be replaced by a new set of teeth. This first set of teeth that we eventually shed are referred to as the milk teeth. Milk teeth, and like I said, they are usually temporary, 20 in number, and then when they go, they are replaced by what we call the permanent teeth. And just in case you hear deciduous teeth, it still refers to the milk teeth because they can be shed, they can be lost and then replaced, they regrow. But for the permanent teeth, if we lose them, we don't get them back, like they are gone forever. Now, Having said that about dentition, having talked about the fact that man can have the milk teeth and the permanent teeth, dentition may be described as homodont or heterodont. When we say dentition is homodont, it means that all of the teeth in the organism's mouth are the same type, maybe not necessarily the same size, but their shapes are the same, no specialization. For example, in fish, all of the teeth are essentially the same, no difference. Unlike in man, in man, we say our dentition is heterodont. Heterodont in the sense that the different teeth that we have in our mouths are of varied shapes and sizes. And these different teeth that we have in our mouth can be classified as follows. We have one group that we refer to as the incisors. Then we have another group that we call the canines. Then we have what we call the premolars. And then finally, we have the molars. Now, in an adult man, we have 32 teeth. And out of these 32, some are incisors, some are canines. Then we have premolars and molars. Now, how many of them are incisors? How many specifically are canines and so on? That can be represented in what we refer to as a dental formula. So a dental formula is a write-up that tells us the number of teeth in one half of the jaw of an organism. So using man, for example, the dental formula of man shows us the number of teeth on one side, not the entire jaw. It means, therefore, that the number of teeth we see in that expression will need to be multiplied by 2 in order to get the total number of teeth in the mouth. See the dental formula of man. We write it this way. We say for man, the dental formula is incisors 2 over 2, canines 1 over 1, premolars 2 over 2, and then molars 3 over 3. What this means is on one side of the mouth we have two cane on two um, incisors up two and then down two. 
Then for the canines, we have 1, 1. For the premolars, 2, 2. And then for the molars, 3, 3. So, if you count the total number of teeth here, you have 4, 2, 4, 6. The total there is 16. So 16 on one side, 16 on the other. So the total number of teeth in man will be 16 times 2, and that is 32. So it means that when we see the dental formula of different organisms, we should bear in mind that it is for one half of the mouth. Now in some organisms, certain regions do not have teeth. For example, in um, herbivores that do not necessarily require canines, the canines may be missing so that after the incisors, you see C equals 0, 0. In that case, it means that from the incisors, you'll be going straight to the premolars, and that space between the incisors and the premolars will be called diastema. Is there the diastema in man as well? The answer is yes. What people call gap tooth is actually called the diastema. So it means diastema basically means any part of the gum where teeth have not grown, where we don't have teeth present, we call them the diastema. Okay, so having talked about the diastema, the incisors, we say the incisors have a chisel shape, they are ch chisel shape, and they are used for cutting. We want to cut soft material. If you're cutting anything soft, you use your incisors. For the canines, we say those ones are sharp. Yeah, they're usually very sharp. You have them on the side. And in some animals, they could be very well developed, such as in lions. You see canines like that. So canines are usually sharp, and they're used for tearing, not for cutting. Then the premolars and molars are used for grinding, for chewing. So when we consume large um, chunks of food and we have to grind them into pieces, we require our premolars and molars. Now having talked about dentition, I'll tell you about enzymes after this short break. Welcome back. Talking about enzymes, we say enzymes are organic catalysts. I'm pleased to say they are catalysts that are found within living systems and they help to promote, to alter the rates of chemical reactions occurring within living systems. These organic catalysts that we call enzymes are usually protein in nature. That means in terms of what they are made of, of they are usually proteins. And these proteins, of course, like other proteins, can be denatured by extremes of temperature or extremes of pH. That means enzymes within our bodies, for example, would work best at our body temperature and at our body pH, depending on the medium where they are working within the body. So once the pH becomes too high or too low, or temperature becomes too high or too low, these enzymes become incapacitated, they are not able to work, and most times the effect can be very disastrous on the entire organism. Now enzymes are also known to be substrate specific. What that means is, Every substrate has its own enzyme, or you see every enzyme has its own substrate. So an enzyme that acts on a substrate A would usually not act on B. So enzymes usually have that specificity in terms of their substrates. Now, um, a word on how enzymes work. We say enzymes work by what we refer to as the lock and key hypothesis. So if you had a key, let's say this is a key, I would like to save time with this. If this is taken as a key and then here is a lock, like a padlock, the key represents the enzyme and the lock represents the substrate. So usually when an enzyme goes toward the substrate, what happens? We say this is enzyme and this substrate. By the time the two come together, you find something like this. At this point, the key has entered the padlock, so we call this the enzyme and substrate complex, enzyme substrate complex, when the enzyme has bound itself to the substrate. Then beyond that, the next thing you would see is something like this. In this case, you find that the padlock is open now, so the 
key has acted on the padlock, the enzyme has acted on the substrate, so the substrate is no longer substrate but product. So we call this the enzyme product complex. And then by the time the enzyme detaches itself from that product, we have something like this. So we call this enzyme and product, two separate things. Now you notice that the key remained what it was, but the padlock has changed. So we say enzymes are usually unchanged at the end of the reaction or their actions. Now the enzymes that bring about digestion, because we're still looking at the nutrition now, the enzymes that bring about digestion in man are usually grouped according to their substrates so that we begin to speak of the carbohydrates carbohydrates are enzymes that break down carbohydrates but you remember that carbohydrates are divided into the monosaccharides polysaccharides and uh, the disaccharides so for those that break down polysaccharides we call them polysaccharases so polysaccharases will break down polysaccharides like starch. So an enzyme like diastase is a polysaccharase. So I'll write it here, diastase. It's an example of the polysaccharases because it acts on polysaccharide. Then we also have those that act on monosaccharides and disaccharides. We call them glucosidases because they break down glycoside bonds. So the glucosidases or glycosidases, any of those terms, refers to enzymes that break down glycoside bonds in monosaccharides and disaccharides. So enzymes like hexokinase, okay, let's not use this now because it's not very appropriate. So let's talk about enzymes like um, sucrase. Yeah, sucrase, which is also called invertase, is an example of glycosidases. Then beyond that, we have the enzymes we call proteases. Proteases are enzymes that act on protein. And these proteases are usually divided into the exopeptidases and the endo. Peptidases. What's the difference? The exopeptidases are known to break peptide bonds that are on the outside of the polypeptide chain, whereas the endopeptidases finish the work. They break the inner bonds that we have in the polysaccharide chain. Then on number three, we have um, the lipases. Lipases generally are enzymes that break down lipids. So fats and oils, for example, can be broken down into fatty acids and glycerol by the lipases. Examples of lipases would include the enzyme called stepsin. And then for proteases, of course, they are very popular. You have things like pepsin, you have things like trypsin. All of these are examples of proteases. So these are the three major groups that we have as far as nutrition is concerned. So having talked about enzymes, we'll see how these different enzymes function in man. So when we come to digestion in man, I'll tell you about how the different enzymes in different regions of the digestive system in man perform their functions. But that will be after this break.